Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. We've extensively documented the Allied campaign against the fascist kingdom of Italy in multiple videos. But in all of our examinations, we have never taken a look at the little-known Italian civil war that occurred between 1943 and 1945. This war was waged between Mussolini's puppet government and the brave yet underrepresented Italian partisans, who, at their high point, were in control of much of northern Italy. In this video, we will focus on the internal struggles of the Italian people against their oppressors and its uncertain transition from fascism to democracy. Before we continue, I'd like to offer a special thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Company of Heroes 3. Company of Heroes has long been one of my favorite RTS games, and I'm very excited for the upcoming February 23rd release of the third title in this series. Focused specifically on the Mediterranean theater in the Second World War, this latest installment of the COH franchise allows you to experience new layers of strategy, from the all-new turn-based dynamic campaign map to the powerful full tactical pause feature, command armies, and campaigns on an incredible scale like the Deutsches Afrika Corps' assault across Libya, or the Allied war effort to liberate the Italian peninsula. Iconic and familiar wartime units and equipment such as the Tiger I, the Flak 88, Churchill, and Greyhound will return, while exciting new units such as the Semavante, Panzer III, and Humber menace the battlefield for the first time. Company of Heroes 3 features four factions designed for multiplayer and co-op play, each packed with their own mechanics, tech trees, battle groups, and more, offering incredible strategic depth and replayability. Experience the ferocity of the Mediterranean theater in cinematic action, from the sweeping deserts and oases of North Africa to the sleepy fishing villages and rolling mountains of Italy. You can support our channel by checking out Company of Heroes 3 using our link in the description below. By spring of 1943, Benito Mussolini's mishandling of the war had turned the majority of his political party against him. Though holding near total authority as prime minister, Mussolini was technically subordinate to the reigning king of Italy, Victor Emmanuel III who could remove him from office at any time. But Victor Emmanuel was a notoriously cautious monarch, and had deliberately fostered the fascist regime in Italy to preserve his own authority. It was not until shortly after the fall of Sicily that opposition forces dared to approach the king, and it took multiple assurances from president of the Chamber of Fasces and Corporations, Count Dino Grandi, before he agreed to back Marshal Pietro Badoglio as the next prime minister of Italy. Emmanuel was desperate to cling to power, and viewed Badoglio as an easily manipulated underling who could be relied on to help him reassert his authority over Italy and negotiate a favorable ceasefire with the Allies. But even with Victor Emmanuel's backing, Grandi knew that a dangerous struggle lay ahead, as several other members of the Grand Council were still ardent fascists who remained committed to the war effort. On July the 24th, the members of the Grand Council of Fascism met in the Palazzo Venezia to decide the fate of their nation. Outside, smoke still rose from ruined factories and Basilica of St. Lawrence, devastated by Allied bombing raids just five days prior. The mood was exceptionally tense, with Dino Grandi going so far as to conceal a pair of hand grenades under his jacket in case violence broke out. Though armed black shirts surrounded the building, Benito Mussolini entered without his personal bodyguard and immediately launched into a furious defense of his own actions. Grandi replied with a speech that beseeched the king to resume control over the nation, and concluded with a vicious jab at the Duce himself, let perish all factions so that the nation can live. Arguments raged back and forth throughout the evening, as the various fascist members of the council rose to argue their points with the supporters of the king. After nine hours, the council was split over several Ordina del Giorno, or Orders of the Day, each outlining a radically different course for the nation. 
To break up this confused tangle of conflicting interests, Grandi demanded the unthinkable, an actual vote. The first to take place in the entire 15-year history of the council. To his immeasurable relief, Grandi's order of the day carried a majority, and a broken Mussolini was forced to deliver it to the king in person the next day. Victor Emmanuel then ordered his arrest, and informed Badoglio that he was the new prime minister. Within hours, huge crowds were swarming through the streets of all major Italian cities, defacing statues, chipping off murals, and making bonfires out of former fascist regalia. The Grand Council would disband itself shortly thereafter, bringing Italy's 21-year-old fascist regime to a stunningly abrupt and ignominious end. Unfortunately, this extraordinary political upheaval left many unanswered questions. Most prominent of which was what exactly to do about the eight German divisions that began advancing into northern Italy on the day of Mussolini's arrest. King Victor Emmanuel was still backing a highly authoritarian government ruling under martial law, and his pleas for assurances of Allied support for the monarchy delayed the opening negotiations to take Italy out of the war. For 45 days, the government struggled to assemble a coherent agenda, while the king relapsed into passivity. In the end, Badoglio arranged secret talks with the Allies, signing the Armistice of Casibelle, which assigned Italy the role of co-belligerent against Germany. But the Allies refused to alter their existing timetable for the invasion of Italy, and Badoglio was unable to arrange a defense of the nation before being forced to publicly announce the armistice. In response, Case Axis was devised as an operation to disarm the Italian military and set up a puppet regime in northern Italy. On September 9th, with German troops racing toward the capital, Badoglio, Victor Emmanuel, and most of their government fled south into the waiting arms of the Allies. The subsequent power vacuum in Rome allowed numerous opposition parties to emerge from hiding, including the Christian Democrats, the Socialists, and the Communists, who quickly founded the Committee of National Liberation, or CLN. September 9th was also the starting date for Operation Avalanche, a massive amphibious landing at Salerno by the U.S. 5th Army. Their goal was the capture of Naples, which had already been heavily damaged by Allied bombing campaigns. Social order had almost entirely broken down thanks to the widespread arrest and detention of the Carabinieri, or Italian police forces, who had been deemed a monarchist threat by the German occupation. On the 12th, Colonel Walter Scholl took command of Naples and declared that up to 100 citizens would be executed for every German life lost. Scholl then ordered 240 Neapolitans living near the coastline to evacuate, making it clear he planned to demolish the entire port district to deny it to the attackers. This was accompanied by a declaration that all Italian males aged between 18 and 30 would be conscripted for forced labor, and a day later, Scholl dispatched troops to round up as many men as possible. This caused huge crowds of mostly unarmed Neapolitans to burst out onto the streets, their ranks augmented by a few soldiers who had managed to escape detention. The following chaos would be known as the Four Days of Naples, with uncoordinated but highly motivated groups of partisans striking at the occupiers in any way they could. On the third day, the partisans gained the upper hand after corralling Colonel Scholl inside the city stadium, where he was forced to negotiate for the release of Italian prisoners housed there. A day later, the German garrison began to pull out of the city, leaving the partisans battered but victorious, and the vital port facilities intact for Allied usage. While the people of Naples made their stand, major events had been taking place further north. After his arrest, Mussolini had been detained in the heavily guarded Gran Sasso mountain complex. The question of what to do with the former Duce was solved for the Allies on September 12th, when German special operative Otto Scorzani rescued Mussolini from captivity and spirited him north to become the Prime Minister of the new Italian Social Republic, also known as the Republic of Salò, or RSI. 
but Mussolini's failures had hardly left him in good standing with Adolf Hitler, and his new fascist regime was all but completely subordinate to its Nazi counterpart, with Germany seizing the Italian gold reserve and allowing the RSI only a token military force. Mussolini, however, was allowed to recreate his personal militia, who would quickly come to be known as the Brigate Neri, or Black Brigades. Formed expressly to suppress partisan activity, the Black Brigades would operate closely with the German military and assist in many massacres of Italian civilians. But news of these war crimes would strengthen the resolve of the Italian citizenry to resist the RSI, and Mussolini's first conscription campaigns drove thousands of middle-class Italians to flee into the mountains and take up arms against the fascist puppet government. These initial guerrilla bands were primarily composed of communists, augmented by deserters or Italian soldiers who had managed to keep hold of their weapons. Some were also outright bandits, who terrorized the local peasantry for personal enrichment. The situation was made worse by constant Allied bombing campaigns, focused primarily on the three industrial cities of Turin, Milan, and Genoa. In March of 1944, several hundred thousand Italian workers in Milan went on strike pleading with the RSI to stop making their nation a target by supplying weapons to Germany. Of course, Mussolini rejected these demands, and the protest was suppressed, with thousands sent to German labor camps. This was the last straw for many Italians, and thousands began flocking to the banner of the CLN. In an effort to reassert dominance, the Germans would retaliate by slaughtering 335 Italians in the Ardiatine Massacre. A few months later, German soldiers and Black Brigade members surrounded the village of St. Anna di Stazema. None of the villagers had been directly implicated in a partisan attack, but the Germans executed 560 of them anyway, in an effort to terrorize the rest of the populace into submission. But far from cowing the partisans, the brutality of the RSI and its allies only encouraged more overt resistance, as between the end of 1943 and summer of 1944, partisan membership exploded from fewer than 9,000 to well over 30,000. Due to the distance separating the partisans in the RSI from their counterparts further south, the CLN would establish a new branch in February, creatively named the National Liberation Committee for Northern Italy, or CLNAI. Thanks to increasing Allied support, the CLNAI began to campaign throughout the mountainous regions of northern Italy, using the rough terrain to strike and then melt back into cover. These tactics were remarkably successful, leading Albert Kesselring to estimate that in the summer alone, partisan activity accounted for over 20,000 German and RSI casualties. Unfortunately, this daring campaign would come to an abrupt halt at the start of the winter, when British General Harold Alexander declared the Allied advance would not continue until spring. With intense cold driving the partisans down from the mountains, the RSI was able to make a significant comeback. The CLNAI was also in a difficult position due to the minor detail that 70% of its members were outspoken communists, which made the Western Allies distinctly wary of closer cooperation. This led to the signing of the Rome Protocols, where the two halves of the CLN agreed to voluntarily disarm as soon as the liberation was complete, in exchange for the Allies guaranteeing their support while hostilities were ongoing. The spring of 1945 marked the beginning of the end for the Axis in Italy, and an escalation of violence between the two sides of the civil war that exceeded anything seen previously. In April, the Allies began their final assault on the Gothic Line, accompanied by a message from the Italian Communist Party to the CLNAI, telling them it was time to launch a final insurrection against the RSI. Leveraging their ties to the disaffected workers in Turin, Milan, and Genoa, the Communists went above and beyond expectations, launching a general uprising against the RSI that plunged the whole Po Valley region into anarchy.
Mussolini reacted to these events by going into a state of shock, desperately ordering his token military force and black brigades to suppress the rebellion, while dithering between negotiating for his own life and making a glorious last stand of some sort. On the 25th, he left Milan, along with his personal guard, and made a dash for the Valtellina Redoubt at the base of the Alps. Though he joined up with a retreating column of German soldiers, Mussolini's fate was sealed when partisans attacked and surrounded them. Having no wish to die alongside the dictator, the Germans negotiated for their freedom in exchange for abandoning Mussolini, his mistress, and various other Italian fascists to their fate. Mussolini would be executed within 24 hours and his body put on display for public mockery. It is a testimony to just how completely insignificant Mussolini was at this point that his death was ultimately little more than a footnote in history of the Italian Civil War. With the Germans scrambling to flee Italy, the CLN AI swept up the remnants of the RSI with little effort, with over 250,000 partisans facing less than a tenth of their number in black shirts and fascist loyalists. But the CLN AI was not about to rest on its laurels, and instead raced to establish improvised courts and execute as many members of the old regime as possible before the government in exile could return. This was a dangerous time for Italy, as some of the hardline communists saw this as a chance to carry Italy into a full socialist revolution. However, cooler heads in the movement knew Britain and America would never tolerate the emergence of a communist nation in the heart of Europe, and even Joseph Stalin condemned the idea. Thus, the Italian Communist Party instead slaked its thirst for fascist blood with its show trials and summary executions before politely cleaning itself up and taking a seat at the table of the new Italian democratic system. Perhaps seeing the writing on the wall, the exiled Victor Emmanuel III chose to abdicate in May of 1946 and pass the throne on to his son, Umberto II. But with the nation still racked by civil unrest, Umberto decided his best option was to stage a referendum on the continuation of the monarchy. Surprisingly enough, the Republican side squeaked past with just 54% of the vote, but this would have little impact on the momentum of the CLN in post-war circles of power. This was followed by the Togliatti amnesty for both communists and fascists alike on the 22nd of June 1946, drawing a line under the bloody reparations conducted during the last days of the Civil War. For his extraordinary bravery in standing up to Mussolini and his fascist allies in the Palazzo Venezia, Dino Grandi would spend most of the rest of his life in quiet exile before returning to Italy shortly before his death. While many nations during the Second World War played host to partisan movements and collaborationist governments, Italy stands out as unique for the extent to which brother fought against brother. Though both the Allied and Axis forces did their best to prevent Italian soldiers from the RSI and co-belligerent armies from clashing, no such effort was made to keep the fascist black brigades and partisans away from each other's throats. Even today, the Italian socialist movements define themselves by the experiences shared during the Civil War, and still maintain a prominent place in Italian political circles. Meanwhile, Mussolini's grave is the site of fascist gatherings every year, with a small yet still significant number of Italians still holding sympathy for a man they view as having lifted Italy out of the Great Depression and into the modern era. Yet perhaps the greatest lesson of the Italian Civil War is that even a nation forced to undergo massive economic and social upheaval can hold together and rebuild.